Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the August 3rd, 2021 edition of Bull Sessions. Sorry for the one minute delay, but we got knee deep in electric vehicles and batteries and uh, probably something that we will spend some time with in the fairly near future. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by Ken Kavula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad you're all with us this afternoon. Things are heating up. I believe Kim will be unable to join us today, but she sends her best regards and continues to feverishly uh, keep doing her research on our Deluxe and send it our way. But uh, today do, we do want to dig into a couple of things. First of all, I will uh, acknowledge that Ken has won the run for the roses here by the end of the session. We're going to check in the groundhog at the half. We acknowledge the fact that the Olympics are still going on and I modified the, no, I didn't do it. Someone did. Modified the Olympic logo to practice safe social distancing in honor of the environment the last <laughs> I, didn't, couple of years. I didn't notice that. That's, <laughs> that's an interesting take. Okay. Well, Pull it, those rings apart. Put them six feet apart. Okay. It's happening. I don't know if you've watched them. They don't they have to put their own medals on this year. Um, yeah. Hey, we did have a, a winner from our local high school, the silver medalist in uh, ladies weightlifting. So uh, people are celebrating here. And then we'll spend a little bit of time, it's kind of the core of today's presentation, talking a little bit about Dave Ramsey and some uh, very general statements he made about investing in general and picking on exchange traded funds specifically. So we'll, we'll dig into that and just share some thoughts and encourage the audience to come to their own conclusions about that kind of stuff. All right, let's go ahead and get underway. You guys all know the, a lot of familiar names here. Welcome back. You know the drill, the standard drill is that no investment recommendation is intended. This is an educational demonstration, heavy on the word demonstration and illustration, centered on uh, the principles, philosophies, and techniques of the modern investment club movement as promulgated by Manifest Investing and or the National Association of Investors, now known as Better Investing, will express opinions. Please do your own homework. We try to remember to share with you and acknowledge if we actually own a personal stake in a company that is being discussed. We do a monthly roundtable on the final Thursday of every month, um, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We've been doing it for 10 years. Our rate of return on our tracking report portfolio is approximately 19%. If you'd like to be added to a reminder list for that session, again, it's a webcast, so you show up in your uh, your jammies with your favorite beverage, but send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you have follow-up suggestions for future topics for these bull sessions, if you'd like copies of slides, or if you simply have a, a question you'd like to ask privately, send an email to me at markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right, Ken, here's the bullpen for today. You can see we've got Dave Ramsey on here. We're going to talk about ETFs versus mutual funds. My acknowledgement of the Run for the Roses uh, adventure, which has really been kind of cool to watch. Uh, profiles and people who know what they're doing. That actually dovetails with the Dave Ramsey discussion a little bit. And uh, we'll update everybody on where the challenge, Ground Dog Challenge, stands. And we will be tackling those topics and other suggested topics in uh, weeks to come. Any thoughts or have you been nailing any landings lately and, and winning medals? Uh, I've, I've had a couple of, of interesting uh, winners recently that, that I'm, I'll be glad to talk about when we get to some of these spaces. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's go ahead and keep chugging away here. One thing that I we do like to point out, we didn't get started very uh, promptly today, but um, very often before these webcasts, including the, the roundtable, especially the roundtable and some of the bull sessions, we will kick the doors open 5, 10, 15, in some cases even 20 minutes early for what we call the green room. Again, very informal. We could talk about just about anything. And a couple of weeks ago, it might have been last week, I, I, I don't remember, we were talking about how life seems to go faster as we age. And I came, uh, this kind of fits into that realm of uh, being a little bit worried about who's listening to what, because this showed up in my feed um, kind of mysteriously, but it turned out to be a pretty neat uh, discussion on YouTube, this Veritasium 
is kind of kind of like uh, what's his name uh, Neil Tyson deGrasse so it's Degrassian and it's a uh, I, I found it to be quite entertaining, but why life seems to speed up as we age. So it's just the type of thing that every once in a while will trickle across the, the green room. And and uh, my life certainly sped up this weekend. It sure seemed like it did anyhow. <laughs> On the highways of uh, Illinois, Michigan, Iowa, etc. So check that out. Just an example of something you can uh, get a kick out of. Here's our chart for the week. This is one of our favorite uh, long-time charts. And Ken, I think you'll like this one. Uh, again, it's the S&P 500. It happens to be shown in blue on this chart. Those are all the ultra-large companies, the, the uh, basically all mega caps in the S&P 500. You can see the blue line. It's been on quite a tear. If you look back at this actually going back over a longer period of time, it usually lags that red line. The red line is the value line arithmetic average, and that includes not just the large caps, but uh, the medium caps and the small caps. Um, in the value line arithmetic average, we again refer to that as an all of the above uh, average of companies in, that we keep track of. And the fact that this thing has fallen and lagged so much just says there have to be some opportunities out there in the, in the medium sized and smaller companies. What are your thoughts, Ken? Well, Mark, uh, I, how much influence is a good word? Does the uh, do the top four or five growth stocks have in the S and P five hundred? In other words, how much of this uh, positive upward momentum here is due to Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, those stocks? Do we know? Off the top of my head, I can't cite a figure. I can say that it is frequently discussed. It usually comes down to like the top 10 companies, you know, so you get your Googles, Facebook, Microsofts, Johnson & Johnson's, there's a couple others in there, Amazon now. Uh, yeah, they do have a, a disproportionate effect, and uh, the cap weighting really does not does affect that quite a bit. So, again, the larger cap companies, by the way, all of those companies we just mentioned are in both lines. So, again, it's kind of like the undercurrent or beneath the surface, those medium and smaller companies are probably, so long as they're firing on all cylinders and they're quality companies, there has to be some bargains out there. All right, so that's just our thought. We do have a second chart for this week, and that's because we made a reference to it last week, and it actually came up in some of our updates, just the magnitude of the drawdown in the Chinese stocks. This Golden Dragon is actually the 98, I believe, largest Chinese companies traded on the exchanges. And uh, if you look real closely, you can see that it actually approached 90 and got down below 45. So that's over cut in half over the last few months. And it was really quite a significant drop uh, last weekend, prior weekend. But uh, that's a mess. And that just shows the magnitude of the mess. Have any other things come up I, this week for you? I noticed, yeah, I noticed that that the official uh, spokesperson for the government in China uh, did some work a week ago trying to calm the markets a little bit, but it doesn't seem to have really created any upward momentum. It, it seems to have maybe uh flattened them out just a touch but be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of weeks whether they can actually turn this around it it does appear to me that maybe they overshot whatever goal they had uh and they might be having some worries about about that very fact at this point yeah all we can do is continue to read up on it it's still a mystery to me as to what in the world they could have possibly been thinking but uh i mean you know the example with edu if you want to study it more closely as an investor i mean that's a company where they, they basically said we're not going to allow you to advertise we're going to stop uh, uh supporting you in any way whatsoever and you know you're looking at a stock price that went from thirty dollars a share to two dollars a share in a company that 
isn't even certain it will continue to exist. So that that's a pretty significant amount of damage to a. Well, and the the flat out statements out there, Mark, uh, by the the party that uh, making a profit from tutoring is something that can't be done in that country. Uh, it just is will be illegal going forward to make a profit from tutoring. Uh, it it's a certainly a a broad sweeping statement, and what it actually means, I think we're going to have to see. But uh, it, it's <laughs> I, I wonder how you enforce uh, that type of rule if you if you make an attempt uh, to put it into place. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I mean, it's 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 just hard to believe. I mean, I, my my vision goes straight to sitting around the conference room uh, table on a Monday morning and sitting there saying, "Well, the government just told us that our our business model is no longer going to be allowed." <laughs> now you know, anybody got any ideas? You know, that had to be a tough one. Mark, we're getting some questions. Is the value line index an equally weighted or a cap weighted uh, index? Do you know? The value line index is equally weighted. Okay, so uh, average. The S and five hundred. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe next time. Uh, I know that there is an equally weighted S and P index as well as the normal S and P index. Maybe next time we can put up a graph showing the equally weighted S and P uh, and how that compares uh, to see if there's. Uh, I I I know that there are people on uh, the Talking Heads channel that uh, like to use the equally weighted occasionally to show you how much influence the top uh, ten percent of stocks have in that index. But uh, uh, I guess um, we might want to take a look at it and see how it looks compared to the value line uh, arithmetic. Duly noted that this could be construed as apples and oranges a little bit then, and I'm I'm 99% sure that the equally weighted uh, S&P 500 is the ticker symbol Evelyn Frank Alpha EFA. So you, anybody wants to take a quick look at that, you can. Okay. All right. Well, we have reached the magical half year point. That's my friend Bon Jovi up there at the top, along with our, our dear friend, Punxy Phil. Doesn't this just make you want to do that detour, Ken, to head to Punxsutawney? <laughs> yeah, next time I'm I'm headed east, Mark. Okay. 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 <laughs> that's, uh, folks, that's as close as I've ever gotten him to say yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take it. Here's a look at the standings as of August 2nd. We have 43 people actually beating the Wilshire 5,000. We usually see a few more people doing that, suggesting that maybe a little more fence busting in this year's contest. The average return has crept back up to about 6%. You can see at the top there. And uh, again, some very familiar names. I think it might be poetic that Terry from Pittsburgh, uh, a neighborhood, uh, I, I think Pittsburgh is probably a suburb of Punxsutawney. Um, so, Terry, that, that's a good one to have up there at the top. Barb Masters from Indianapolis is making a strong run, as is our dear friend Nick from New York. And, of course, that uh, local model club is making a real uh, real strong statement so far. There's, congrats, Ken. I hope everybody's... Uh, There's a, we're actually generating a little bit of excitement about this contest, Mark, within the... <laughs> Not only the Mid Michigan Model Club, but the B.I. Baker Model Club. They're both in the top 10, and uh, folks are becoming a little bit excited. It's now, like you said, six months into the contest, and I don't think we've ever had one club in the top 10 uh, at this point in the contest, let alone two clubs. Uh, so it's 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 an interesting process. Yep. So some familiar names: Bill Thompson, Aspirin Update. So Bill, if you're in the audience, you're at number 16 there, and and uh, just a whole lot of familiar names that we can't wait to see, Saul and Marty and and Herb and a number of uh, knights on there. And, of course, our uh, roundtable, once again, is leading the institutional pick. So we'd like to see that persist also. So from top to bottom, uh, I have faded down to around uh, triple digits in the rankings. So <laughs> hopefully I'll have a really strong second half, uh, me, and, me and Kathy. 
Kathy, that's not meant to be disrespectful. It's just a reminder that Kathy Wood, who's among the the hottest investors over the last eight, nine, or ten years, um, has had a cold six months. And uh, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to get to the end of the year and see her easily, you know, back in the top 100, you know, with a disproportionately good second half of the year. So that's just a that's just a a nod in her general direction, also. All right. Well, here's kind of our core topic for today. And you can see that I've uh, actually put notes all over this. It's from a, a tweet that Dave Ramsey uh, did fairly recently that actually caused kind of a mini explosion of uh, uh, some fairly pejorative responses to it. And, uh, and I, I thought we'd just take a moment to sit aside and, and talk about it a little bit. We have talked a little bit about Dave in the past. I generally generally agree. Pretty good overall philosophy. I, I do think you have to be kind of careful about throwing a, a blanket of advice, uh, which applies universally to everybody, because one of the things I know in dealing with people and investing in uh, situations, those situations are very specific and individual-centered. And uh, so that that alone, you know, places something like this at risk. And he basically comes out and says mutual funds are probably the way to go. And that is probably true for the average investor. And then he does emphasize growth. And again, that's a, a function of where you're at in your personal life expectancy and your your personal investing psychology and uh, throws that international component in there. We could spend a whole hour talking about that alone. What I have done is just separated out a couple others. I mean, I don't really think about real estate in the same way as investing, but it is. But you really have to put that one in a different context. Dave is uh, is just completely opposed to any form of debt, uh, making any type of interest payments at all. And and I would argue that a mortgage, you know, properly managed and, and rightfully sized is not exactly the end of the world. Um, so I kind of separated that one out. In that top group, what are your thoughts when you when you see uh, this, Ken? Well, I I read this list uh, a, a fair amount of time ago, Mark, and and was immediately struck uh, by the inclusion of ETFs in the don't invest group uh, when he puts as number one in the invest group mutual funds, and there's a heck of a lot of ETFs out there that. I can't really differentiate as far as holdings are concerned from a lot of good solid mutual funds. Now, <laughs> maybe it's the it's the point that most mutual funds are actively managed and there's many ETFs that are nothing more than a static basket. Uh, maybe that's where he's coming from, the, the active versus the static characteristics. But I think there's a lot of advantages to uh, well-constructed ETFs uh, that I don't have to worry about, that I do have to worry about if I invest completely in mutual funds. And then, of course, uh, I, I'm a, 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 in favor of investing in, in a, uh, a reasonable-sized portfolio of single stocks as well. Uh, I do think that that I can come close to the market or beat the market most of the time uh, in a, again, a reasonably constructed, reasonably sized single stock portfolio. And I'm not talking about holding 50 or 75 stocks. I'm talking about holding, you know, 15 or 18 stocks and, and manage them prudently, um, keeping, patience and discipline at the top of the list, uh, I, I think I can turn that into very profitable uh, circumstances so that uh, it becomes something that forms the core of, of my investing. Mm -hmm. I cool. have had a lot of mutual funds in my portfolio as when I was younger, and I'm down to only two mutual funds now in my portfolios and they're both international funds. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, those two circled in blue are certainly against our religion. We are we are different. I mean, when I say we, I'm speaking of, of our community because we believe that you can invest in a focused 
concentrated number of uh, stocks and do pretty well. I do think his comment, again, directed to the general population, uh, probably falls into the mode of people who, you know, listen to the tips at the barbershop or hair salon, a hot stock tip from the brother-in-law while you're munching on hot dogs in the backyard, um, that type of stuff, performance chasing, all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, I can see where that type of investing in stocks, uh, you know, could be vulnerable to that, and he is warning against that for sure. Um, I, I would like to hear sometime, you know, some some form of acknowledgement uh, of the notion of investment clubs and the potential, because you know, Ken, your 19 clubs are all beating the market, um, pretty good deal. And actually, I should retract that and make it a factual statement. Your four model clubs are beating the market, so it's it's you know it's it's not a it's not impossible. It's certainly not guaranteed, but it's certainly something that is quite feasible. Um, I stuck the black box around the, the, the those in the middle because I'm I'm a, I understand where he's coming from here too. I do tend to put those into the category of if you're not dealing with an estate planner, most of those things are probably not the best idea for an individual. I mean, there are there are pl points where uh, people accumulate a certain amount of wealth and want to engage in some protective measure measures and some tax management policies and stuff like that. That um, again, if you're working with an estate person, sometimes some of those vehicles can actually end up making a little bit of sense. But to the average investor, not, not quite so much. Of course, Bitcoin, any crypto, it's not investing. It doesn't even belong on the slide. It is gambling. It can be some fun. I mean, I had some fun a few weeks ago with Ethereum. But uh, And I do want to concentrate in. We'll go in a second to uh, taking a look at funds versus ETFs because we just want to boil it down into what are the advantages, kind of mysterious as to why he's made this difference. But he singled out this micro-investing. And I think he's probably, again, I'm reading between the lines. I have listened to him a little bit. I, I think he's kind of in the penny stock lane here, uh, you know, watching out for penny stocks and that kind of stuff. And uh, Ken, Ken uh, I think you and I are both staunch advocates of finding uh, high quality small companies some of those might even be micro companies uh, and that's why the red rabbits on the slide um, I, I just think that some some wonderful gains can be made investing in uh, smaller companies sometimes in your backyard well we've even suggested mark when we're looking for small companies that there has to be a lower limit to to what the company produces and we've suggested that maybe uh, at 50 million in revenue or less, you're you're not suitable yet for uh, investing in you know in any uh, serious way, uh, and uh, that's certainly where a lot of the lists that we look at for source material uh, come down as well. They they not only set a uh, a top limit for what they consider to be a small company, but they set they do set a minimum that you must produce in order to be considered for whatever list that we're looking at. So uh, maybe that's where he's going with micro, you know, down at the bottom of that, that list, uh, companies that are extremely small and like you said, penny stocks, things like that. All right, so let's go ahead and get into some of the details of uh, ETFs versus funds, because that's really kind of the core of what was kicked around. And and Ken, I think we'll just use these as talking points. Uh, the main difference to, uh, to again, you, you already hit on it. He was talking in many cases, because uh, he started this campaign a few years ago when the average exchange traded fund ETF was really in it, more of an index, unmanaged, but that has changed. That has definitely changed. And the, really what you're talking about today is something that trades like a stock on exchange every day, intraday, versus a mutual fund, which is conventionally and traditionally traded as a, based on the end of day net asset value. So just different mechanics involved. Um, that's certainly not a deal breaker for us in our community. I mean, whether it's a good ETF or a good mutual fund, I don't think the mode of purchase would have much difference. The second point there, transparency of holdings, that is pretty important to us at Manifest. The fact that the fund holdings are changing daily for the exchange traded funds and uh, the the holdings on a mutual fund really are only uh, editing or getting modified every three to four months. Um, so 
obviously the ETF is going to reflect the, the the current holdings in a fund um, much more timely, if you want to think of it that way. Minimums, mutual funds can have really high entry fees to get in. Uh, ETFs, you can buy a single share. So that can make a difference. Transparency of trading costs. Um, there's quite a bit of transactional cost with a mutual fund. Um, and from my experience, and, and, and Ken, we talked about this briefly, I'm not seeing the same type of, uh, of costs associated with ETFs. That must have something to do with the fact that it trades at a lower uh, expense ratio. Well, I, I think you have to look, Mark, uh, at the difference in net asset value uh, of the ETF versus what it's actually trading at. Uh, and that's a, a calculation that I think you can do uh, as long as you have an accurate listing of what the fund holdings are. Uh, and I would assume there would be a slight difference, uh, which basically is accounted for for profit that the ETF uh, might might take, uh, plus the fact that there have to be some expenses that are incurred. Uh, this uh, transparency uh, of trading costs. Uh, I've I've never uh, heard of a closed end uh, ETF, uh, and I've never heard of a an ETF uh, that is is dealing with trading uh, and tells me that. Uh, I can't buy shares of it because uh, they've they've decided that I'm not part or that that they just don't want to sell any more shares. They don't want to put any more money under management. Oh yeah, right. So, as far as a closed, yeah, I would yeah. be surprised to see that happen someday. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'm not aware yeah, of any so, of them doing that. So I think those are a little bit uh, major differences, and whether you put it under minimum investment or put it under transparency of trading costs. Uh, they definitely enter into that whole uh, that whole issue right there. And you had mentioned the tax thing, and it's something that I had actually forgotten about. Because again, my, the only mutual funds I hold are in qualified accounts, so it's not something that I'm uh, real sensitive to. But you know, when you mentioned that, I can actually remember my neighbor back in Chicago walking through the snow in his sandals to show me his uh, mutual fund statement towards the end of the year, the fund had gained virtually nothing and he had a tax bill. And uh, that that certainly is a consideration um, between the two that, that probably doesn't get talked about enough. All right, so expense yeah. ratio, did you have more you wanted to add to that? Well, Len Douglas is, is telling us that if you're searching the internet, you find allegations that Ramsey is getting referral fees <laughs> from mutual funds and financial advisors. Now, uh, that you know, it's it's something you can find on the internet, and boy, I I know that I can find almost anything I want on the internet. So uh, take all that kind of information with a grain of salt. But there is scuttlebutt out there that that he's uh, skewed a little bit towards those people because he's getting fees uh, yeah. from those people. Uh, what what I don't like about a mutual fund is that I don't know until November, sometimes early December, uh, what my tax ramifications are going to be in a mutual fund. And if I have a large holding in a mutual fund, uh, my experience was that there were many times when I suddenly had a, a huge capital gain or, uh, or a short-term capital gain that I had to add into my tax planning. Uh, and it, it, it really was something that I couldn't uh, do in what I felt was a very efficient way. Uh, those, those figures were coming at me, like I said, in late November, early December, and then I had to work in those, those extra estimated taxes for those kind of things. I had to work them in with my fourth payment of estimated taxes. And sometimes that was a, a not an easy thing to do uh, with any kind of a large spinoff. I also found that, that uh, you, you got tax ramifications even in years when you 
figured to yourself you weren't going to have a lot of tax ramifications. Mm -hmm. uh, years when the market didn't do anything or made very small gains or losses, and you'd suddenly find yourself with with a lot of trading expense, even though the the fund made you virtually nothing at all during the year. So it it I I'm not. I'm not a fan of that kind of of situation where I can't plan ahead at least uh, eleven or twelve months ahead, and you can't do that with a with a mutual fund. Yeah, and that can be quite turbulent. Yeah, and on the expense ratio side, they they are generally higher. In fact, if you take a look at VTSMX for at Vanguard, the expense ratio there is point three or point three five, um, something like that. The same the same number of stocks the same stocks completely in the etf which is vti has an expense ratio about half i do expect those two to to approach each other uh probably with the higher ones going towards the lower ones in the future but hey jack bogle waited a, a long time for the average expense ratio to dip down where it ought to be and and uh he's cheering on from heaven now uh, with respect to lens remark, you know, in the, in, in the manifest forum, we'll just go ahead and stipulate that, uh, yeah, this was advice, very broad brush advice for investors all across the spectrum. So that that uh, says a few things, but Matt Spielman and, and Brad Taylor, Lynn Douglas and, and Ted Brooks all had comments about, you know, reimbursements and perhaps some incentives, that type of stuff. And I don't think it's a secret. I do think that uh, some of the advisors that are, in the Ramsey network, I uh, do seem to focus an awful lot on funds like the American funds. We'll look at that here in a minute. So there are fees, commissions, sales loads, and uh, you wouldn't see any of that on the ETF side. I mean, I trade ETFs all the time and uh, without paying commissions of any kind. So those are just some of the aspects that uh, are into place and, and um, part of the consideration. We have an interesting question from Dennis, uh, Mark. He wants to know, uh, do you have a reason why you think Ramsey deserves our attention? I, I guess my my overarching thing is because he has really changed a lot of lives favorably. Um, in, you know, in the work that he has done in helping people get a better handle on not just their investing, but their entire financial situation. Uh I think he's earned uh, a tip of the hat in that that direction for sure. So I, I don't think that that's uh, that is definitely merited. Based on I, I mean I've seen it I've, I've seen it in people around me. So uh, I just think that his advice here is perhaps a little too global, if that is the word that could be used. And a lot of people follow him, so it does make sense to pay attention to what he's saying and how people are reacting to it. Doesn't mean you have to do uh, it. We also have a, a point, uh, and it, it's it's more of a question than a point. And how would you classify something like Berkshire Hathaway? Is it a mutual fund in you know kind of masquerading, or is it an ETF, or what exactly is Berkshire Hathaway? Berkshire Hathaway is a conglomerate. It's basically dominated by its financial services assets. Um, it's not a mutual fund. It, I mean. It, might tend to behave one, like one a little bit, but no, it's a conglomerate with separately managed pieces. And I'll just add that it doesn't report to its shareholders like a mutual fund either. No. Uh, it reports to its shareholders like a common stock. Uh, and that's, it, it trades as a common stock. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, the, the, the thought has validity. I just threw this one in here because one of the most, um, attention grabbing things and maybe this goes to the question that was just asked um i had posted this on dave ramsey almost 10 years ago and one of the things he does do when he's talking on the, the radio and I've, I've heard him do it a number of times is with that question on italics up at the top he talks about a mutual fund with a 12 percent return since 1934 is your investment advisor too stupid to find this so i i responded and i i, I tried to keep it clean and fair and just basically point out no it's not hard to find that it's also not hard to check into the performance of a particular fund. And I basically went through uh, an assessment of of this particular opinion, and it has trailed off a little bit of late. But just I just found it interesting that this did attract 
the most attention of anything that I've posted in, that reached the public. That's our blog, expectingalpha.com. We don't post a lot there, but um, this one was the most heavily trafficked uh, post that we've ever seen. And uh, here's the core of that the question and the, some of the suggestion, the, the comment made by Len. Uh, when an advisor that convinces a client to buy into this particular fund and others at American Funds, there is a commission, and it's a relatively high commission compared to uh, others these days. I remember back 20 or 30 years ago, there were commissions out there at 8.5%. I don't know if any of those still exist, but uh, that is a relatively high com commission. Uh, again, you can buy the same basket of stocks and uh, not pay that, uh, but in this case, that is... That's an incentive and it's compensation going to these investment advisors. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised uh, to see that there would be a, a flow of funds uh, to the Ramsey organization also. Uh, that would be normal business. And I suspect they probably disclose it if I if we dug deep enough. But that's kind of the core of that, the question and the comment that was made. And you can find that on Morningstar. Just look under the price and and, and check and see what the actual cost is it can make a significant difference. Because again, if, if you're relatively new to this, if you're paying that, let's call it a 6% front load, 6% commission, uh, if I'm investing $100 into uh, a regular old index fund and, uh, and I buy one of their index funds, only $94 gets invested. So you actually have, you're, it's basically, basically like one of those Olympic races where they start by, you know, with a, Behind staggered start. A staggered start. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> All right. And here, well, this is one of our favorite slides. You talk about our core principles. Every percent matters. And uh, what we're talking about here, you know, that 5.75%, that's quite a few notches on that ladder. Um, so, again, doing better, finding um, better investments, lower cost alternatives, can make a massive difference over time, and we know that. And uh, so we're always trying to do that. Our good buddy, Walter Schloss. Okay, here's our current list of the top 20 funds ranked by their relative return over, if they have that much experience, 10 years. Some of them are newer than that. And uh, what you see here is from, uh, again, sorted by relative return. There is Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK. Uh, has the best performance since December 2014 for sure, and it's it's basically just rocking this entire field. And uh, from top to bottom, you can see uh, how these have done. You're talking about returns in the mid 20% over the the trailing decade or so. Now down the middle, you see the ones that actually have these sales commissions, call it, referred to as loads, and uh, I actually put them in red because if I'm actually doing research in the fund arena. I want to notice that, and that actually will ding uh, the long-term return also because we factor that into the analysis of the investment. But uh, you can see that uh, there's a whole lot of here that are no load, and you can also see the expense ratios, and you can see that the expense ratios for the ETFs are generally less than one, even the very actively managed ones. And then here you've got a sector fund from in a sector ETF from Vanguard, the expense ratio is almost free. Here's the QQQs we've talked about quite a bit. Again, no expense ratio, so there's very little um, headwind with respect to cost and expenses with with uh, the ETFs. That's what makes them fairly attractive. Notice here you have an ETF that's very focused on a particular industry. So again, they're not all just baskets. Some of them are more actively managed than others. I really like the Motley Fool um, ETFs. These the ones with the, the four letters or three letters without an M, the M out in front of these stands for mutual fund. So you can actually use the table to start to get a, a feel for uh, top to bottom. Now we know that the, the top performing uh, funds, whether they're mutual funds or ETFs, all have this growth characteristic. Again, something that we talk about a lot with our all of the above investing. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Um, so I, I stuck stuck this fund that uh, is your investment advisor too stupid to find this fund from, from Dave Ramsey. 
and just wanted to point out it actually has a decent growth rate. It has a decent quality, better than decent quality. Really good, pretty good across the board. It does have that heavy load, but on this update from the last time I looked at it, you can see that it now lags the market by a couple of percentage points, and its return has only been 14. So again, 14 is pretty good over the long term, historically, but specifically over the last 10 years, the difference between the average of those top 20 and uh, this American fund, it's a pretty, pretty good sizable difference over the last 10 years. So it's just something to be aware of. Again, this, this, the Walter Schloss ladder of grabbing for better returns, lower costs, all that type of stuff. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Anything grab Mark, will you? Will you? Yeah. Will you clarify something for me and for a couple of folks in our audience? If it doesn't say nine, uh, or if it doesn't say 2011 as the performance uh, start, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Motley Fool 100 says 2018. Is that because the fund began in 2018, or is that when uh, Manifest started to track it? No, that's exactly right. It's when it began. So that this, okay. this is their entire. So this this is performance since inception. You know, for Kathy, it's the end of 2014. Uh, I think. Okay, this, so this, the, the few funds on here that are uh, 2018, and there's one 2020. Uh, we might put an asterisk over by the relative return numbers and just make it clear that it's a much shorter history, right? Right. But keep in mind that anytime you're doing relative return, you are benchmarking it versus the the benchmark, which in this case is the Wilshire 5000. So, you know, it corrects for differences in the market return with, you know, basically with the matching investment. Same thing we do for the round table, same thing we do for anything else. So it, Right, but, but the bottom line still is, though, that uh, what somebody might be able to do in two or three years might be more difficult to do in 10 or 12 years. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And for that, we really do dig in and uh, take a look at what are they specifically invested in. So we're going to, we'll take a look at that for the American fund here specifically. But, you know, we're, we're look, what we're looking at here is people who know what they're doing. Uh, these funds have been successful over the, the time frames slotted here. And uh, notice we have the projected return on value, average projected return on value, average projected annual return for these companies. And so we're, we're also characterizing, we're not just chasing the funds that have been the best, we're chasing the ones that have been the best, but continue to be the best position going forward. So again, that's, that's a, a big part of it. We're not just chasing the performance, we're basically using that to identify people who know what they're doing and then let's find the best positioned ones amongst them uh, if you are investing in this type of an arena. So here's a look at what's actually in that particular fund. Uh, this is the American Funds Investment Company of America, AIVSX, and these are the actual holdings. And you can see it's pretty pretty good representation from top to bottom uh, of com com companies that are basically household names, with a couple minor exceptions from top to bottom, but a lot of uh, companies that we find quite a bit of interest in, this number is relatively high. So it's it's a, it's a well-constructed portfolio. So if you're out there and you hold some of this one, I certainly wouldn't run screaming from it. One thing that I do notice with this one, and I've noticed it with a few funds, uh, they have a fair amount of cash. Uh, it's actually four, a little over 4%. Sometimes that cash gets reported in the, the summer, and sometimes I have a hard time uh, the cash that actually shows up in the portfolio as a cash asset uh, sometimes doesn't seem to be included in cash on hand. And it's almost, it's almost like a way to hide. They, these guys don't seem to be doing that, but 4% uh, is in that cash fund. Here's a look. I've, at I've, noticed, I've noticed Mark on a number of um, mutual funds that I dive into that many times uh, they own Google, but they own it twice with two different tickers. And you you need to be aware of that if you're looking for the biggest holdings. Google actually ranks up there with some of the biggest holdings when you put the G-O-O-G-L and the G-O-O-G together as a percentage. 
And by the way, Google blew the doors off in their earnings report and uh, yeah. got all yeah. kinds of upgrades, uh, fundamental upgrades here over the last few days. All right. Here's a look at, here's one of those new ones. And uh, Fidelity Blue Chip Growth. Now, it's not a new fund. The Blue Chip Growth Mutual Fund has been around for a long time. And they just made a, a cousin ETF that mimics pretty closely the holdings in the mutual fund, but now you can buy it as an ETF. Again, another reason why I think at some point uh, the expense ratios are going to merge, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe there's something about uh, the expenses with a, one of these that I don't get. Um, th this is a particularly attractive fund with respect to the return, with respect to the growth, a little bit higher growth than the, the American fund. Um, what I did find kind of interesting with this one, and this is the doorway to that topic we were talking about in the green room, Ken, uh, these guys have a really good track record at, over at the Blue Chip Growth Mutual Fund at Fidelity. But check these out. I mean, you basically have these, which are emerging companies. You see the single-digit quality ratings here? And a lot of them are related to things like Lyft, Tesla, Uber. Um, I just find Carvana. I just find that kind of fascinating that these guys are going that heavily after. And you can see down here what I'm referring to, the same thing we were talking about, figuring out, you know, where are the interesting investments? in the emerging electric vehicle and as, as Len was saying it's been emerging for 10 years or more at his house um i just find that kind of fascinating that amongst amongst this collection of very high quality companies they do have this plethora the word for the week plethora of electric and battery and vehicle related stuff any thoughts uh i <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that, <laughs> I hit you cold, didn't I? I? <laughs> yeah, you did. I I think that that uh, it's interesting that that these holdings, uh, some of these uh, what I would consider kind of risky holdings, uh, take up as much of the portfolio as uh, as it actually does, and that they call it blue chip. Uh, yep. I don't I don't know if if when you put you know. 12, 14, 15% of your holding uh, into something like you've circled there. And uh, of course, this is only the top two thirds of the companies, whether or not it, it keeps the, the name blue chip something that is, is as valid as I would expect uh, by looking just at the name of the fund. Uh, I'm surprised to see these companies in a blue chip growth fund. I guess that's that's the short of it. That's that's exactly the way that I felt. And you, know, you circle a couple more down here. Um, you know, the gaming stuff is here too. So I, it's almost a little bit of a Kathy Wood wannabe behavior. Um, yeah, uh, I was surprised, interested, but surprised. And I, it, yeah, might be, it might be enough for me to look for a different fund where it truly is all blue chip growth. Yeah, and keep in mind when Mark's pulling up these uh, these charts of what a fund owns, he's not showing you the complete list of stocks that are owned. Uh, usually, oh, we've five. discovered uh, Mark's discovered that that when you look at the top fifty or fifty five percent of the holdings. You usually get enough of a picture to tell you what is happening in the entire fund. This is only the top 64% uh, of the assets. So there's still 36% of the assets that are down there. And, and that might be another 25 companies for all we know yeah. or more. We might dig into that a little bit deeper. What Ken is referring to is this is the percent of assets that are represented by these top 25 companies. That is, in my experience enough to characterize and make a representative analysis of the fund but it might be kind of fun to compare the etf to the mutual fund and see what uh we can learn over the years yeah this but, this fund starts out exactly the way i would expect a blue chip growth fund to start out i mean apple amazon google microsoft facebook nvidia uh even marvel you mm -hmm. know but but then it it moves uh, <laughs> 
kind of skews a little bit around there. So uh, although Tesla it does have a 62.7 quality rating, so maybe we shouldn't be tarring Tesla with the same brushes as Lyft and Uber, Mark. Yeah, there will be no tarring of Tesla here. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, just something kind of interesting to watch, but I was surprised. So, again, going back to uh, what David had to say, um, uh, again, I think it's decent general advice. I, I don't think that the ETF uh, condemnation holds up very well anymore, and it would be really cool to see him uh, acknowledge that and maybe kick the door open a little bit to uh, a wider playing field and a larger menu for some of the people who are involved. So I think we'll just leave it at that, Ken. All right, on to celebration mode. This was fun. Back one year ago, uh, some of you probably remember there were a number of regional banks showing up on our screening results. In fact, it was so prevalent that uh, both of us were audibly scratching our heads during the webcast. And uh, Ken did a whole bunch of homework on the entire thing and basically came back and said, I still believe in these companies and actually uh, selected a number of financial companies for some of our portfolios and for the round table for the tracking portfolio led in a, his infatuation with first financial was palpable. So uh, a year later, Ken, I just have to tip my hat to you because I figured I could beat you with great Southern bank corp. And I, I think I made a decent run at it. Do you agree? Well, it, I, Great Southern is a, is a wonderful bank. There's not, not very much wrong with it. But I will tell you that, that uh, I owe Ross Meredith uh, as much public uh, acknowledgement and recognition as I can ever give him. Uh, Ross is a retired bank examiner that uh, helped uh, better investing and, and helped me uh, determine uh, some really fast ways to look at a bank and uh, come up with a list of, of the highest quality. And his emphasis on this metric called return on average assets, uh, which is measured and called out in the better investing tools, uh, this return on average assets has proved to me to be something that uh, it, it's just batting a thousand right now in my estimation. Uh, it's helping me separate banks into two piles, uh, those that are excellent to superb and those that aren't. Uh, and the returns on these banks that are demonstrating return on average assets up around one four, one five, one six, and doing it consistently for three or four or more years uh, are just night and day compared to the returns on banks that maybe are giving us only one one or one two or one three return on average assets. Now those numbers for those banks that I just repeated uh, those are still stellar numbers, a 1.2, 1.3% return on average assets is still a pretty darn good number when you consider that the average bank gives you only a 0.85. Uh, but when you can find these banks that are up around 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 or better, and when they're doing it over recent history for three, four, five, six years, then you have something on your hands that when banks start to turn around, these highest quality of the bank stocks tend to turn around first and tend to make you uh, some of the best money that exists. I, I would put uh, Western Alliance Bank in this same uh, uh, group uh, as being uh, something that that was a highly rewarding bank when people rediscovered that bank stocks maybe had something to offer. I think we're at another point right now where if your club portfolio or your individual portfolio doesn't have a bank in it, 
I think you should be seriously looking. Uh, and my uh, exploration has been in regional banks. I think there's a number of great opportunities in regional banks, and you might want to do some serious digging and start by using that uh, number that's called out at the very bottom of the first tab on any one of the bank uh, visual analysis sheets. And again, it's ROAA, return on average assets, and you're looking for a number around 1.5 or better, and you're looking for it to have occurred in the last three, four, five, six years, the, the more uh, of a length of time that you can see that number stay up there, the higher the, the quality of the earnings in the particular bank. So uh, I'm, uh, again, Ross, thanks for suggesting that metric to the people at BI that matter. And, and thanks for explaining that it's a fundamental core uh, concept uh, that uh, bank examiners look for in helping determining the quality of the earnings in a bank and how profitable the bank actually is going to be. That's a great point, Ken. Thanks, thanks for sharing that with, with everybody and reinforcing. I think that, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to spend some time on the ocean between Seattle and Alaska with, with Ross, and uh, I, I agree. What a, what a gift and. Again, I think it dovetails nicely with Kim's uh, preoccupation with, uh, you know, return on capital and just this notion of, you know, I think it, there's a translation there. When it comes to bank, not all assets are created equally. Some assets actually get into trouble and they, they start causing loan loss provisions and stuff like that. That was the way I would boil it down as a non-accountant. So the, the quality of the assets as shown by the return on assets you know, where they do stay out of trouble is, is a key figure. So good yeah, stuff. And not all and not all income for a bank is created equal uh, as well, Mark. Uh, Absolutely. If you, if you find your bank beginning to depend on on income being generated by non assets, uh, things like fines and fees and and extra charges, uh, that's a that's problematic as to whether that can continue. Uh, before your customers uh, look for somewhere where they don't have to deal with all of that kind of, of fiddly do with, with whatever the bank happens to be. Yeah, I think we call that a la carte stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. We're coming up on an hour, so just want to issue that reminder that we do archive all of these presentations. You can get them a la carte. You can get them one at a time. They are free. Um, just go to YouTube, search on Manifest Investing, a page that looks something like this will come up. You can see that we archive the bull sessions, the roundtables, and uh, well, now the expected returns review. We have one of those coming up on Saturday morning as I wrap up the newsletter. Also, as you, as you will notice across the very center here, when we do one of our uh, multi-session conferences, those are also archived here also, so you can reinforce some of the stuff that we've talked about here today also we've had three of those successful investing conferences and i suspect there will be a another one in your not too distant future so again just a reminder that they are archived there um, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to be notified anytime we make an addition to the content there and we would appreciate that also all right so here's the picture that told me I was in trouble. This is from a couple months ago while walking around a neighborhood in Savannah, Illinois, when I was out visiting our in-laws. And uh, I actually came upon this and thought I, I would preserve it in posterity for, this was my, my sign while walking that I was in trouble in the run for the roses. This is actually a neighbor to uh, the in-laws out there in Northwestern Illinois. So Ken, I knew I was in trouble and uh, I began writing my concession speech when I saw <laughs> All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you uh, spending your time with us here this afternoon. Thank you, Ken, for your uh, never-ending contributions. Will you please let me win the next contest? Uh, I mean, I'm oh, gonna... I'm going to try as hard as I can not to, Mark. Not but, to let uh... me. 
you'll you'll win you'll win as many as as I win usually more. So you know what they say about blind squirrels uh, having luck and finding a nut sometimes. So uh, you're I'm doing okay uh, in that area, uh, but uh, you you win an awful lot of things that we compete in. So I'm I'm happy to let you do that. I will I will warn you and the audience that I, I am going to keep that. Uh, competition between Great Southern and First Financial, uh, uh, but you probably won't ever hear about it again unless Great Southern pulls ahead. <laughs> All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get off to the rest of our week. I've got an issue to put together and some numbers to crunch. So again, thanks everybody. We'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, I think